Let's do it. God is good. All the time. Great is the Lord. All the time. Here we go. Let's do it again. God is good. All the time. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. No matter where you, what you may be walking through or walking in here today with, uh, this should never waver in these two truths. That God is always good and he is greatly to be praised. The message the Lord has laid upon my heart to bring today is something he spoke several weeks back. And I wrote it down in my notes and wrote it down as a future message until God was ready to pull it out and, and speak it. Because over the last several months, God has been flipping things around from the way that I, I see certain things, showing me a different approach or vantage point to areas in my life. And as he reveals them to me, I can't help but change my approach and how I visualize them moving forward. The most recent one that he showed me was in a midweek series called The Full Armor of God. And I've always prayed healing from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And that perspective comes from the anointing oil and understanding that that anointing oil just rolls and it just flows down from the top of the head down to the feet. So there's nothing wrong with that thought process. But in that series, God began to show me the importance of my shoes and the peace that I stand in. And understanding in that, in that shoe, in, that, in the shoes that I'm wearing, it ignites every other piece of armor that I have on. As I cement my feet in the word, salvation, righteousness, and truth become evident. And so from that revelation, I've been praying the opposite, that God would heal them from the bottom of their feet to the top of their head. That through the word of God, it would enrich their life with healing. Today, God has shown me another way of looking at an analogy I've only seen from one perspective. But today, with God's help, I will try to lay out a different vantage point for us all to see. So that instead of avoiding it or dreading it, we will embrace it. So the title of today's message is God of the Valley. And with this, why not bring out one of the most famous scriptures and one of my favorite from David that talks about a valley? Because I believe from this one scripture, we have assumed what a valley looks like and base all our experiences on this one assumption. The scripture I'm talking about is Psalms 23, and I'm going to have it on the screens for us today. I know I normally have you take it out in your Bible, but I think a lot of us know it by heart. So I'm just going to have it on the screens today. I'm going to read from my Bible. It says this, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. First, I want to talk about the misconception. Is that the valley is a shadow of death, deep darkness, filled with sorrow, pain, or grief, overcome with fear, or a poor vantage point for any battle. The valley, from this perspective, is a negative place, having no real value and needs to be avoided at all costs. From this perspective, we run from the valley and consider it a punishment if we must walk through it. We would rather jump from mountaintop to mountaintop instead of ever having to go through the valley. Because of these assumptions, we dread and fear the valley. We become anxious and timid as we get closer to it. 
We try our best to avoid it or prolong the inevitable. We hold back and push against the pull towards the valley. We consume our thoughts with presumptions of what we think we will encounter and remain committed at all costs to fight against it. From this perspective, the enemy has created an illusion of what the valley looks like and therefore robbing God's chosen people of the benefits that lie within it. See, the enemy knows exactly what the valley is. He knows its purpose and its fulfillment. He knows God's plan for it, and he knows just what will happen to you once you go through it. So he tries his best to paint a picture of what it is before you ever get there so that by the time you do, you won't want to encounter it. This is the misconception I'm setting up for you this morning. The enemy paints a picture of what that valley looks like before you ever get there through everything that I just spoke. So that when you get to the valley, you do not want to encounter it. Today, my job is to destroy these lies. To place truth in front of you so that the illusion of the enemy can be displaced. The first statement I want to express this morning is, if you're not willing to go through the valley, you will not be ready for the mountaintop. Amen. If you're not willing to go through the valley, you will not be ready for the mountaintop. I've watched countless leaders try and do this. They quickly skip through the valley or avoid it altogether just to get to the mountaintop. But what happens is, instead of giving God the glory, we take on the glory. And we promote ourselves. This morning, I want to flip things around as God has done for me, for us to see the value in the valley, not just in the mountaintop. See, without the valley, you will not be able to handle the mountain. And I pray after today, you will see how foolish it is to think otherwise. The valley's purpose is for equipping. We must go through the valley so that we can be tested, tried, and strengthened to be ready for the mountainside. Three scripture verses I want to read out this morning. Again, they'll be on the screens that give us some clarity as what I'm trying to bring us into of what the valley actually looks like. The first one, 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. A workman tested by trial. Who? Should have stayed up there. Has no reason to be ashamed. And accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. The next, James 1, 2 through 4. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And lastly, James 1.12, if your faith remains strong, even while surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. True happiness comes as you pass, pass the test with faith and receive the victorious crown of life promised to every lover of God. Now, I don't know about you, but all I heard was positive effects Amen. from walking through the valley. Which then shows me the value in it. Blessings, endurance, and approval are just three of the many things we can receive when walking through trials and testing. As I was praying on this subject, God brought me to the Beatitudes. I love how God just completely changes Scripture verses for me whenever he's trying to show me a point and something specific that he's trying to get across. 
We all know the Beatitudes. I've even taught on them uh, for a series. But it talks about blessings. This is what it says up on the screen. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. God blesses those who mourn. God blesses those who are humble. God blesses those who hunger and thirst. God blesses those who are merciful. God blesses those whose hearts are pure. God blesses those who work for peace. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. And God blesses you when people mock you. And it says at the end, be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Thank you, Lord. See, it always seems confusing to think that God would bless me when I'm poor or mourn or when I'm hungry and thirsty or mocked or persecuted. These are not things that we would consider joyful, happy, and incredible moments in our life. If you're poor, it's not a happy thing. If you are mourning, something just happened. That was negative. If you're hungry and thirsty, you're without food. There are things that God is stating in this, but yet before he says any of those things, he says, blessed are those. See, what God is really saying is, I'll bless you in the valley. I'll bless you in the valley. He restores you. If you read on, I, I took all those parts out because I wanted you to see what God was expressing. But if you read the Beatitudes in itself, it says, I will bless you when you mourn, for I will be the one who comforts you. So God is expressing to us that in the valley, he restores us. He comforts us. He satisfies us. He shows us mercy, gives us an inheritance, and reveals himself to you. All within the valley. All of these things are positive, not negative, as the enemy would try to make us believe. They happen in the moments we need him the most. See, when you're mourning, you're grieving. There's something that's taking place in your life. From the perspective of understanding of mourn, God showed me an entirely different perspective of what mourn was in a, in a, in a past message. But uh, for today, I want you to understand that mourning is also a, a sense of grieving, sadness, tearfulness. And so something has had to happen in your life for you to mourn. Something has had to happen in your life for you to be poor or hungry or thirsty or humbled. Ourselves and pride within us doesn't want to be humbled. The valley's purpose is to humble you. But this is what happens within the valley. The valley so easily gets construed as a place of imminent death. But God sees it as a place filled with life. Today, I want you to see a completely different picture of what the valley looks like. And if I did my job, you will leave here with an entirely different perspective of the valley moving forward. Because the valley is not a place of death. It is filled with abundant life. John 10.10 10 says, A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. That is a promise, saints. Something we can grab a hold to, that God, you said that you wanted to give it to me in abundance, more than I could ever expect. When you begin to grab these things and understand, and you begin to express these promises to the Lord, He backs them 100%. You find abundance in the valley. And the enemy's purpose is to rob you from entering it. My desire today is to reveal to you that there is more value in the valley than there is on the mountain. So much so that from this point on, you run down the mountain just to get to the valley. 
You heard me say in the beginning that God's flipping some things for me. See, I've always viewed the valley as a place where, okay, I've got to get through the valley to get to the mountainside because, boy, I can't wait to get to the mountain. But God's changing things around for me so that I understand that I should be, I can't wait to get to the valley because of what God does in me in the valley. See, this is a mind shift perspective. Because for so long, I've looked at the valley as less important than the mountaintop. My purpose this morning is not to disregard the mountaintop, but better yet, reveal to you our need for the valleys. To cherish them and embrace them. To realize that in order for us to accomplish God's greatest work in us, our faith must be tested. Is that not something the church needs to hear today? Your faith needs to be tested. Dr. Warren Wearsby said, faith that cannot, I'll put it up on the screen for me, faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. Faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. This goes back to what I said earlier, that many have tried to go untested to get to the mountaintop. But the true test lies on the mountaintop. And if your faith wasn't tested in the valley and found approved, then you will fall from those heights and find yourself back in the valley again. The valley tests our faith. And the mountaintop proves that we can be trusted. 1 Peter 1.6 tells us that our trials reveal the sterling core of our faith. And this faith is more valuable than gold that perishes. For even gold is refined in fire. Your authentic faith will result in even more praise, glory, and honor towards the Lord. Saints, this is our purpose, as I have been expressing over the last two, pe- two weeks. God created us to worship Him, to praise Him, to exalt Him in every season, every situation we walk through. Our whole life's goal is to get up and breathe with the air He has given us, to breathe it back out in praise and glory to His name. The valley's purpose is to refine you, to reveal the hidden truths that can only be found within it. If we remain timid to step out into the valley, then we are missing out on all the blessings God is waiting to give us along it. This illusion the enemy has placed in front of you must be destroyed if you are to realize your need for the valley. There is rest in the valley. Psalms 23, 1 through 3, we just read it, said this, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength and he guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Just think about the moment, the mountain for a moment. There isn't much rest when climbing a mountain. Is there anybody that has climbed a mountain before in the room? Is there much rest in climbing a mountain? No, no, I've seen people resting hanging on a tent on the side. Quite scary if you ask me. You've got to put it, that's a whole other message, right? You've got to put your trust in that rope and, and, and all the different equipment that comes with that. But there's not much rest on the mountainside. And even when you get to the top of that mountain, you can't stay there for very long. And then the climb back down is just as grueling as the climb up. So when we think about the mountain in physical terms, it's not a restful experience. When you get to the top, you're looking at your your weather map, making sure that you're protected from whatever is going to come in those moments. 
And we must move down, back down the mountain if we have to get out of harm's way. There are so many things happening on the climb up, the top, and the climb down on the mountain. Whereas in the valley, there's rest. You find streams and green meadows. Places to rest your head. Fires to cook the food you find. You're finding food on the side of a mountain? You're looking to hunt for something on the side of the mountain as you climb it? No. You already did all of that on the ground. You made sure you were prepared, equipped, and ready to climb that mountain because you knew there was no rest and there was no eating unless you brought some cliff bars or something. But you weren't going to find your food. You're not going to find streams on the mountainside. You're not finding green meadows along the mountainside. The mountainside's purpose is for you to get to the top. So that, again, not that there are green meadows and streams, but that you can see all that you just walked through. You get to see the stream you just fished at. You get to see the green meadow you went dancing in. You look at where you pitched your tent and, and, and made the fire from the top. The valley's purpose is to strengthen you. To affirm God's promises over your life. To instill confidence and trust in the one who has never left your side. To reflect on all that God has done for you. See, the place in the valley allows God to begin to develop you and strengthen you spiritually. He's able to allow you to make some mistakes in the valley because there's not really that much farther you're going to fall except to the ground. But make a mistake on the side of the mountain and what happens? See, if we're not prepared and going through the valley with expectation for God to reveal some things to us and equip us and strengthen us and go through the trials and the mistakes along the way, then we will be ill-prepared to climb that mountain. And God's love for us is so deep that he doesn't want you to go to the mountainside until you're ready to climb it. Until you've been equipped and prepared and strengthened. That you've got a map in place. That you've been through the, the safety protocols and made sure that your harness and all of your ropes tested and ready. The valley. Its purpose is to grow us. See, the valley has a far greater purpose than you realize. And I pray that after today you embrace the valleys in your life with expectation. Knowing that God has a purpose in the valley. The title of today's message is God of the Valley. I want you to see this from his perspective this morning because as I wrote this down, it really showed me something. He is the one who made it. He created the valley for you. And each of us have a different valley we've got to go through. But he created the valley with you in mind. He constructed it. So no harm will come to you within it. What type of God that we serve that would create a valley for you and then harm you in it? That's not the God that we serve. The world we live in and Satan himself wants to harm you. But God is not a God of harm. He's not here to hurt you. So if God created the valley, and then the, the text verse expresses us that he, the shepherd, will walk with us in the valley. Yes. Hallelujah. He said he will walk with us in the valley. And he has given us his rod and staff to comfort us, but also to fend off whatever the enemy wants to do in our life. Whatever comes our way, whatever battle that's trying to get on us or destroy us, we're able to have his rod and staff that will comfort us, but 
but also weaponize us to keep the enemy at bay. That the word of God within us is being instilled every single day. And God is the same God on the mountaintop as he is in the valley. God is the same here and here. And if you only see God on the mountaintop and not in the valley, then you're going to be just like I said in the beginning, weary, fearful, complaining. God, don't make me go through the valley. It's a valley of death. It's a valley of destruction. It's a valley of sorrow and mourning and, and, and poorness and, and being hungry and thirsty. God, this is not the valley I want to go through. I want to be with you, God, on the mountaintop. Just float me across to the next mountain. But when we forsake the valley, we forsake everything that God wants to give us in the valley. When we surrender to this understanding, we will race toward the valley more often than away from it. The valley prepares us for the mountain. It equips us with the tools needed to climb it. And if we do not submit ourselves to it, then we will be unprepared to succeed at reaching the top. Now, I want you to know this because of our loving Father. God's intention is for you to climb and reach the peak. That's his intention for every single one of you in this room. His intention is not for you to stay in the valley. I'm talking about the valley this morning, but God's intention is not for you to stay in the comfortable, fire-lit, tent, bed, stream, fish place in your life. Because the longer you stay in the valley, the more comfortable you get with the valley. And then we start complaining to God about the mountain. See, at the beginning of the valley, <laughs> at the beginning of the valley, we wanted to say, God, just bring me to the mountaintop. Get me there as fast as you can. And then God's abundance and blessing and love and favor and strength and guidance in the valley causes us to say, well, God, I'm not, I'm not really ready for the mountain just yet. I want to remain in the valley a little longer. But God's intention is not for you to remain in the valley. His intention is to equip you in the valley so that you can climb and get to the peak. But if you forfeit the work he wants to do within you in the valley, you will slip and slide back down to where you started. If you skip along the valley... And, and never get tested. And you're like, God, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And you get all the way there. You didn't get equipped with the harness. You didn't get equipped with the cliff bar. You didn't get equipped in every area that you needed along the way. So you're just going to start throwing stuff up on the side of the rock to try to climb it. Or you'll just go up unprepared. And, man, that's a far fall. And if you don't have any ropes or harnesses or preparedness, in, in, in your skills and your strength and in your mind to get to the top of that mountain, it's going to be a far crash and it will hurt you. But God's intention is to prepare you to equip you for it. It is evident to me how easy we can do this. Meaning, skip through the valley or jump over the valley. Skip over the valleys in our lives just to quickly get to the peak of where we think we should be in life ministry, or in society. And far too often, this route leads to pridefulness, doubt, or shame. Because when people realize you cannot be trusted because your faith didn't get tested, they stop following you and you're left all alone. See, it's easy, I want you to hear this, I want to go a little deep this morning with this one moment. See, it's easy to take credit for the victories and blame someone else for the losses, especially when you haven't put in the work. But when your blood, sweat, and tears are found all over the work, you just as easily take the blame for the loss as you do the victory because the work means so much more to you. See, it's easy to blame someone else when you haven't put in the work. You think about it whenever you had those group uh, science projects. You, you went out and got the smartest person on your team. 
make sure that, man, they put all the work in, right? I don't have to do anything, just sign my name. Yep, I was part of that group, I was there. But if she fails, or he fails, oh, can't believe it. Can't believe you put all the, you didn't do it, you didn't do it right. If I, was, it was, if I was involved in it more, uh, we would have done a better job. Yeah. See, we were quick to give it over to somebody who we thought was going to succeed, and when they don't, we just blame them for being unsuccessful. Uh, but when you put the work in, and you see it through, then you've got to take on the blame just as much as the praise. Because you, it was your baby. It was your, you cultivated. You allowed God to use you to, to grow it into whatever business it was. This understanding applies to all forms of employment in the world. From the highest points of work to the lowest. From doing brain surgery to making a cheeseburger. You must be tested to see if you can complete the task before being trusted with the work. It doesn't matter what you do in life. No boss is foolish enough to put you in a, in a role you cannot fulfill. If you can't succeed in the small things, then why would God give you more? We must be faithful in the small things, meaning when we're going through the valley and he's testing our faith, he's seeing if we'll be able to handle more. He's seeing if we're ready for the mountainside. A lot of you in the room are so ready for your mountainside. I'm so ready to get up on the side of the mountain so I can get to the top, God. I'm tired of being in this valley. But you don't realize the valley's purpose. And that God's love for you is too great to see you on the side of that mountain prematurely. And he extends the valley a little bit more for you so that you can prepare a little longer. And he extends it a little more for you. Man, boy, you're getting frustrated. God, I thought I was almost there. But son, you're not ready for the mountainside. Come with expectation every day in the valley to receive from me. And then I can lead and guide and strengthen you and prepare you for the mountainside. And you'll get there a lot sooner than you think if you put your trust in me. Amen. The valley is the work. And your blood, sweat, and tears prove you put in the work. You conquered and overcame. You endured and prevailed. You were tested and approved. See, God has a plan for each of us in the room today. A job he wants us to accomplish. But in order for us to fulfill it, we must, we must go through the valley. But do not lose sight of the fact that in the valley, we reap blessings we cannot contain. Conquer fears we no longer have to deal with. And receive tools that equip us for the climb ahead of us. Amen. See, that's what I love about the Lord. Is that in the valley, I'm able to conquer my fears. I'm able to overcome those fears so that whenever I get to the mountainside and I encounter those fears, I've already overcome them. I've stabbed several snakes in the valley so that when one rears their head on the mountainside, I'm not... Ah! No, I'm grabbing the snake by the head and I'm, I'm, I'm crushing her on the side of the, the, the mountain. Because I've already killed several snakes in the valley, so I'm prepared for the snake on the mountainside. But saints, if you're not prepared, you will fall back down again. Because of one snake. Right before you grab the top of the mountain, that snake comes out. Because you weren't equipped, we miss it. Do not forsake the valley. Because our God is the God of the valley. So what or whom should I fear? If my God's built the valley, knows I can handle the valley, put me in the valley and allows me to strengthen me and get me to where I need to be, then who in the world am I going to fear? There's nothing in the valley my God can't destroy. There's nothing in the valley I encounter that my weapon, the word, can't overcome. 
So what should I fear in the valley? And see, the more valleys we go through with this perspective, the, the more excited we are about going through the valley again. The mountaintop is great and awesome and enjoyable. And everybody wants to get to the mountaintop. But God has changed my thought process from a mountaintop perspective to a valley perspective. Because God does so much for me in the valley. He answers so many prayers in the valley. He heals my kids in the valley. He restores my marriage in the valley. He helps me accomplish great things for him in the valley. Whatever valley you may be facing today, step into it. With all your heart. Do not let the lie and illusion of the enemy rob you of your blessings. The valley's filled with treasure. And God knows just where he hid it. He knows the spots along the way that he's got. He's given you your shovel to dig up. And he didn't put them so deep. It takes every ounce of energy for you to get it out. Right underneath the surface. And he's so loving and kind, he put a big red X on it. We don't even have to have the compass. Oh, there. More treasure. Thank you, Lord. More treasure. Thank you, Lord. Your valley is not meant to hurt you or harm you. It's meant to grow you, strengthen you, and give you so much you can't even contain it. And if you only see your valley as a place of death, fear, and darkness, you'll be so timid to go into it. It'll take you forever to get to that mountainside. But today, God wants to do something in your life. He wants to change your perspective. All of those who are in the middle of their valleys take a new grip from this perspective and begin to look around for the tools and blessings the Lord is placing along your path. God wants to equip you this morning and in doing so strengthen you to accomplish the next climb. But once you pass the test on the mountaintop, and yes, I expect you to pass that test after today's message. And revelation. Be ready to run with passion into the next valley God has for you. Do not be timid any longer and do not let the valley cause you to fear, but let it become a desire of your heart to fulfill. Claim your valleys today and glorify God in every and all of it. Yes, amen. 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 Let's stand.